As workers clear a blocked sewer in Redlands, California, they make a gruesome discovery. My rake was full of debris, so I pulled it out. It was the imprints from the top of the skull. Police cordoned off the area. It started finding, like, parts of the rib. News of the skeleton stuns the quiet community. But the bones are just the beginning. I mean, this is something that's right out of a horror film. Redlands police and maintenance workers carefully examined the skeletal remains found blocking a city sewer. We had these theories that they could have been placed there as a joke by medical students, or it could be a crypt was broken into somewhere and someone placed them down there. These could have been bones that were taken from a grave site 100 years ago, and someone finally just dis disposed of them by dumping them down the sewer system. I thought that it might be a skeleton that was designed for instructions, for possibly for a doctor or something like that soon discovered that there was no mechanical holes drilled into the bones. So that ruled out that theory. An expert quickly confirms the bones are human. Workers began opening up manholes looking for the source. We followed that specific drain line uphill to its last origin where there's no other way any objects can get into that sewer vault. Each vault usually is, on the average, is about six foot in diameter, usually six feet deep, depending on where it's at. We were lifting 300 plus manholes and there was bone, still more bones on the side rails of the line. We did about a, close to a mile, half a mile that we cleaned. They had to block off roads, get in there, do our thing. At the end of the sewer line, police find what they're looking for. When I popped that manhole out to look in it, that's when we found the, the jawbone. Part of the jawbone with uh, the teeth still in it. Luckily, the jaw section in the mandible was caught up on a ledge in the manhole. They showed me it might have gone down into the sewer, and I'm not sure if we would have ever recovered that. The jawbone is a critical piece of evidence. Dental records could help ID the remains. When we were investigating the original bones, we had no identity of who the bones belonged to. The teeth looked someone uh, age of someone 13 to 17 years of age. Investigators check missing persons reports from the surrounding area. Based on the estimated age of the teeth, they focus on teenagers and quickly get a break. As we came by this, I believe it was an insurance shop, there was a photograph of a missing Redlands boy named Tristan Jensen. And one of my co-workers who's uh, really sharp with John and Jane Doe cases looked at it and says, I'll bet you that's who that is. 14-year-old Tristan Jensen had been reported missing by his family seven weeks earlier. Detectives meet first with Tristan's grandmother. Detective Elton and, and Brandon came to the door. I said, it's about Tristan, isn't it? Tristan's aunt tells detectives that news of the discovery made her think of Tristan. I remember very clearly driving to work in the morning, early morning news on the radio, and it was uh, the announcer. I remember exactly what he said. I have heard of skeletons in the closet, but skeletons in the sewer? Here in Redlands? Well, that's right. Remains have been found, and they don't think it's an animal. It could be human. I just you know, gut feeling again. Here we go, that could be Tristan. Family members recall the last time they saw Tristan. He was on his way to try out a new board at a local skate park. It was close to noon when uh, I finally had him come over and say, you have to do your chores now. He was gonna go skateboarding and he took his skateboard and he left, but he never came back. He ended up grabbing his skateboard and he uh, started walking out the door and, you know, he said, later. I said, see ya. 
My mom was kind of upset. They had quarreled about him cleaning his room, and he had gone. Late that afternoon, Tristan still hadn't returned. So I drove around, didn't see him. There's nothing, and just kept waiting. And then he just didn't come home at night. I was calling his friends, anyone that I knew that he knew. I had that gut sinking feeling that something's really wrong, just wrong. We finally did call the police the next day. Dental records suggest the bones are Tristan's, but investigators need proof. They ask Tristan's family for help. The only way to prove that absolutely would be with DNA evidence. And they, they were searching for anything that we might have that had Tristan's DNA on it. We looked for a hat. He used to wear hats for uh, like a ball cap to get some sweat off of it. And it's been six weeks since he's been missing, so all of his laundry had been washed already. Any hair that might have been in his clothes was gone. Tristan's grandmother turns her house upside down, looking for anything that could have a trace of Tristan's DNA on it. Then she recalls a special memento. I remembered that when he was 12 years old and he lost his last baby tooth and I dropped it in my jewelry box, forgot all about it. The baby tooth is rushed to the San Bernardino County Crime Lab to see if DNA can be extracted. The crime lab drilled into the tooth, were able to extract uh, pulp or blood DNA. The test confirms the family's worst nightmare. The skeletal remains found in the sewer are Tristan's. We kept saying, are you positive that it's him? And there was no doubt, no doubt at all, that was him. And the, the pain is just so great. It's something you have to live with, and it hurts. It was a terrible thing. It was horrible. I mean, my, one of my best friends in the world is gone forever now. As horrible as it was, at least we knew what happened to him. Or we knew that was him, and not to keep searching. But as the search for Tristan ends, the search for answers is just beginning. How did Tristan Jensen die? And how did the body of a 14-year-old end up in a Redlands city sewer? DNA tests confirm that the human remains found in the Redlands sewer are those of Tristan Jensen. The bones are sent to the coroner's office for analysis. We're required to contact the coroner whenever we have a deceased person, and we don't know how the person became deceased or where they came from, the coroner's gonna be contacted. Their job is to examine the remains and see if there's any evidence which would indicate that there's trauma. The condition of the bones makes testing difficult. We elicit the cause of death as could not be determined due to advanced stages of decomposition. The conditions of the bones made it appear uh, they had no tissue on it whatsoever, completely skeletonized, uh, no living tissue at all. One of the questions that I had was how the body could go to bone so quickly. We believed that the sewer gases probably really accelerated the decomposition process. Sewer gases are a toxic and corrosive byproduct of chemicals being poured down drains. We were able to determine that with all the chemical cleaners, all the type acids that are thrown down residential drains, eventually flows through these sewer vaults, which washed away the tissue off the bones. But there's something investigators don't understand. How could Tristan's body get inside a closed sewer system? When people think of a sewer system, uh, they think of a storm drain where maybe he fell in. But a storm drain is different than the sewer system. The sewer system's a closed system. Closed sewer system is primarily for collecting wastewater out of buildings like homes, retail stores, restaurants. And that's all it's intended for. There's no rainwater to get in there. No, no rainwater whatsoever. 
Tristan, he was such a small statue of a person. It had been very difficult for him to, to climb in there and actually pull the lid back over the manhole cover and secured it. It's impossible for any type of a human bone of this size to get from a residential house down through the sewer system unless they were purposely put into a sewer vault. Investigators are now convinced Tristan Jensen was murdered and his killer tried to dispose of the body. A manhole cover had to be lifted and the body had to be placed into a closed system. As word of the murder spreads, residents of Redlands are stunned. It was pretty harsh on the, on the town. You know, old, old money town, you know, basically kind of like a retirement town. And uh, these kind of things don't happen very often here. Crime here is pretty minimal. It punched me in the stomach. I mean, I had kids that age. That could have been my son. It could have been anybody in the community. The community appeared to be quite upset that there could be some type of killer that was stalking children and placing bodies into the sewer system. Tristan's family can't imagine anyone harming him. I couldn't think of who would want to hurt him or why all the thoughts are going to your head are so you just can't, you can't fathom it. He was immensely popular with everybody. I mean, he had this ability to, you know, just be that guy that everybody else wants to be around. He had won the most promising music award that Cope Middle School could give. He was really good. He always was making new friends. Everybody knew him, everybody liked him. I don't, I don't think I knew one person that didn't like him. The teachers loved him, he was friendly. But Tristan's life hadn't been easy. He went through a lot in his young life with the, the trauma of losing his mother. And she battled cancer for four years in and out of hospitals and lots and lots of surgeries. And he, he saw her go from the beautiful, beautiful woman that she was to what cancer does to its victims. After his mother died, Tristan was alone. His father was in the Chino jail at that time. Tristan went to live with his grandmother. His aunt and two cousins lived next door. When he turned 13, he actually moved in here. And then that was just, you know, that was the greatest thing ever because now, you know, he was able to be with us all the time. Hoping for leads, detectives question Tristan's friends and neighbors. Part of the investigation is looking at who would have crossed uh, Tristan's life and had a motive or a reason to place him into a closed sewer system. His home is searched for clues. They, you know, took computers and anything that Tristan had from school, any notes, any books, any papers, any notebooks, everything they could read through, anything that might give them some inclination of who could be a suspect. I remember them asking me, showing me pictures of some clothing of his, saying it's his, and, you know, showing me some of the photos and things that really helped their investigation. With no leads or suspects, investigators focus on the sewer vault where Tristan's jawbone was found. Mandeville was found at the top of the sewer vault, sitting on a uh, concrete shelf that's approximately two or three inches above the, the floor of the vault. Based on the way the bone was caught on the ledge, detectives believe that's where the body was put in the sewer system. It's on a street that sees little traffic. The way that the cul-de-sac was, it was isolated, so it wasn't really in plain view. Then, as officers interview residents, they get a tip from a local 15-year-old. This tall young man, he walked up to me and said, there was a, a van here the other night, it was parked right next to that. I think they might have done something to the manhole. It was a generic description, and it was described to be, I believe, a 70s or 80 model van, kind of a darkish color. He saw some people go to the manhole, and uh, I believe he said they were Hispanic, and they saw him lift or put something in there, and they left. Police go door to door, hoping for more information. Often, neighbors will see something that is suspicious and just not give it another thought. It isn't until they're actually questioned when they start talking about something that they saw 
that was unusual for their neighborhood. But no one else saw the van or noticed anything unusual. The police department took a look at it, and uh, they determined there was no red van. Uh, nobody saw anything like that. But neighbors say they do know the teenager who reported the van. His name is J.P. Renson. We were able to come up with several witnesses that had seen J.P. Remsen in and out of the manhole vaults over the past several years. Residents tell detectives that Remsen is a troubled kid. They told us he played there. He set up fireworks in there. Investigators suddenly wonder, was J.P. Remsen telling the truth about the van? Does he know something more about Tristan's murder? On the street where police believe Tristan's body was dumped in the sewer, residents tell detectives about a neighborhood teen with a troubled past. There were neighbors even talking about uh, observing him uh, with an animal, with a cat, using fireworks, you know, with a cat. Investigators remember J.P. Remsen from their first visit. At the time, his behavior seemed odd. J.P. was inquisitive on what we were doing on our investigation, how we were interviewing neighbors. So he was, in essence, following our footsteps during our investigation in the neighborhood and would confront uh, neighbors about what they had spoke to the police about. And that uh, in itself was a red flag. JP's backyard faces the sewer vault where Tristan's jawbone was found. Detectives decide to pay the Remsen family a visit. I walked up to the door with Investigator Alton. I noticed near the doorway there was a box and some knives at the door. And I took note of this when we were waiting for somebody to answer it. Subsequently, Mr. Remsen, JP's dad, answered the door. We got a preliminary statement from him regarding his knowledge of anybody playing in the sewer vaults or going in and out of the manholes, which he had no knowledge of. JP's dad says his son is not yet home from school. The father uh, said he'd be back later, and they talked about some information they had, and uh, I believe the father laughed it off. When I came back later that day to interview JP, uh, the knives were gone, and that kind of struck me as odd. When detectives return, the father introduces them to his son, JP. Before I met him, I was told that he was a, a big boy, and uh, once I met him, I soon realized that he was almost my height. He's six foot tall, I'm six foot one, and uh, he told me that he weighed uh, 270 pounds. With his father sitting nearby, JP reluctantly answers questions. JP told us he didn't know the victim, that he had no clue who uh, Tristan Jensen was, never met him. He did give us some statements that he saw a van pull up to there several weeks prior and then leave. And it was very suspicious, basically telling us that someone else may have been around those manhole covers. Investigators leave with an unsettled feeling about the Remsen family. They decide to take a closer look into the family's affairs. JP's parents seemed like a, a normal family. The father was a uh, banker. The mother was a nurse for a local hospital. They just seemed like an ordinary family um, at the beginning. But beneath the surface, police find a different picture. When interviewing neighbors, we learned that Mr. Remsen was known to build, for lack of better words, we were being told, fireworks in the home, in the garage specifically. Possessing fireworks, let alone building them in your garage, is illegal in Redlands. And there's another red flag. School records contradict JP's statement that he didn't know Tristan. We had determined that JP did know the victim because they had a dispute in school several months prior. They had classes together. So basically, JP telling us during our initial interview that he did not know the victim, we knew that was a lie. Certain the Remsons are hiding something, investigators get a warrant to search their house. 
search warrant consisted of two different investigations that there were destructive devices, not fireworks. At the Remsen home, the other one was for the, for the uh, homicide. The results of the search are immediate and stunning. There were numerous uh, different patterns uh, of, of uh, blood stains located at the scene. Then, before the blood evidence can be examined or recovered, the search is called to an abrupt halt. They found, among other things, nitroglycerin in the garage. I made contact with the sergeant that was in charge of the search warrant, which was taking place at the Remsen home. He told me that he located lots of evidence. However, he says, we're going to lose it all because the house is going to blow up. The Remsens weren't just dabbling in fireworks. They had a garage full of dangerous high explosives. We were going to lose all our evidence if they didn't carefully contain this scene. The house is immediately evacuated. It was an absolute incredible thing to witness. They had cordoned off five whole blocks of the area. People were lined up on both sides of the street, just big lines of people and news trucks, people standing on top of the news trucks trying to get pictures. If there had been a fire in this residence, uh, there would have been fire in several residences. Very unstable and could have blown up half the neighborhood had it gone off. For detectives, it's a potential disaster. An explosion or fire would wipe out critical evidence and could let a potential killer go free. As suspicions about the Remsen family continue to mount, a search of their home reveals shocking blood evidence and a stockpile of dangerous explosives. The Sheriff's Department, they hadn't seen anything quite like this, so they immediately ordered the neighborhood to be evacuated while they brought in further experts to analyze the explosives and determine how stable or unstable they were. We would find something that obviously looks very suspicious and uh, we would stop, have the bomb squad expert come over, take a look, and uh, then, of course, they would uh, have everybody take off. Authorities are forced to evacuate the house. A majority of this crystallized and it had become unstable because it had been sitting in his garage for such a long period of time. Desperate to preserve blood evidence, homicide detectives asked the bomb squad for help. We had a request from the Redlands Police Department to look for and try to protect blood evidence that may have been on a door. We took the door off and uh, gave it to uh, forensic investigator uh, Rick Dysart from Redlands Police Department. At least we knew we had one good solid piece of physical evidence that uh, gave us some sequence of events. It gave us some blood, gave us some DNA evidence that we were able to process. And hopefully, uh, if we lost everything else inside the house, we were still going to be able to solve the crime from this one piece of door. With a growing sense of danger, the bomb squad orders the evacuation of all the homes in the surrounding area. There was a ice chest next to the garage door. And we found what we refer to as Kennepack. These are plastic tubes filled with ammonium nitrate. They're designed to be used as a two-part binary explosive. You put them together, you now have dynamite. Experts decide the explosives are too volatile to move. Some of the items, they eventually had to blow up in place because the bomb squad determined it was too unsafe to even touch. They dug a hole in the front yard and basically made their own little bunker where they exploded the, the items there in the front yard. You could hear it booming all across town. And it, every 10 minutes or so, 15 minutes, there'd be another explosion. There were so many of them. And so it was like the helicopters are going across, and there's squad cars, and there's mobs of people. With the garage cleared, investigators re-enter the house. They immediately find more explosives. 
they went into the kitchen area and they discovered uh, items stored within the refrigerator. They called uh, to the L.A. bomb squad and they, the L.A. bomb squad responded. For a second time, the house is evacuated. The L.A. bomb squad came up code three. I remember the lights coming on the freeway. And they have a particular device that's on a trailer that they can put the material in and explode it in larger quantities in a safer manner. Total number of pounds of explosives that we took out of that residence. And this would be not just the explosives, but the pyrotechnics, the chemicals, the high explosive, and the ammonium nitrate, which was blasting grade ammonium nitrate. It was probably in excess of 1,000 pounds. After the last explosives are detonated, J.P. Remsen's parents are taken into custody. Both J.P.'s parents were arrested and charged with explosive devices, child endangerment, as well as the automatic weapons that we located inside the house. Forensic experts can finally search the house in safety. Finding blood in the hallway was the first thing that we did. There were drops of blood in flight. Small drops of blood cast off from a bloody object. We actually found, a, a, in essence, a trail of blood leading from upstairs down the hallway to the garage. They located blood stains on the carpet and the stairway going down into the uh, basement level of the home. They located blood stains on the walls, approximately four feet above the ground, and a lot of blood on the garage door leading into the garage. Then when we got into the garage, we were amazed. You could see where there was a stain on the carpet, and they lifted up the carpet in a big pool of blood that had dried up. The amount of blood suggests a violent struggle. There were two different locations in the garage where an impact, such as a beating or stabbing event, took place. 10 weeks after the slaying, the stains are clearly visible to the naked eye. Normally, in a case like this crime scene, they have this fluorescent stuff that the crime lab uses, and they can pick up blood and trails. We didn't need that. The blood splatter, uh, which was on the walls leading down into the garage, uh, was never touched, never touched at all. We were kind of taken aback by, oh my god, there's, wow. After all these months, you think they would have tried to do a better job of cleaning up? As the crime scene is processed, detectives pull 15-year-old J.P. Remsen out of school. Detective Brandon and myself uh, responded to the high school because we wanted to question JP again. Remsen is now the lead suspect in the murder of Tristan Jensen. We asked him if he wanted to come down to the police department where we could talk in private, and he agreed. Tristan never come over to your house? No, sir. Never, ever? The... Never one. Do you have anything of Tristan's at your house right now? No, not at all. At first, Remsen denies any involvement in Tristan's death. You're telling us lies. You're trying to tell us something else to keep us from finding out other things. Just because I didn't like him doesn't mean I wish he was dead. You know, I feel real bad about that. I feel bad for the family. Uh, you know, it shouldn't have happened. But, uh, no, I could not just in cold blood never. I couldn't kill someone. After hours of questioning, JP finally admits Tristan was at his house the day he went missing. He tells detectives there was an accident. I had a knife in his hand. He said, you know, he had money. He said, you know, uh, can I buy this from you? And he described how JP and him got in a fight and the victim fell down the stairway and it was during this fall that uh, the victim was holding a knife and the knife caused the victim's death. Investigators don't believe JP's story. If this really happened and they got in a fight and you know he fell on the knife, he would have called 911. He would have called like you or I or anybody else. He would have called the police department. Finally, after hours of questioning, JP admits to the murder. 
the deception and the lies uh, eventually showed that he was responsible for that. So when he was confronted during the interrogation portion, he eventually admitted that, no, the victim didn't fall on, on the knife and get stabbed. I stabbed him during a heated argument, and I stabbed him twice in the chest. Detectives ask Remsen for a step-by-step -step account of the killing. Basically, they asked him if he would do a, a reenactment and if they could tape it. JP told us he would, at which time we conducted a reenactment video, taking him back to the scene, showing us exactly how he committed this murder. With a chilling lack of emotion, J.P. Remsen methodically reenacts Tristan Jensen's last moments alive. I pulled the knife out. Okay. He went limp. Get more solved online. In a stunning confession, 15-year-old J.P. Remsen admits to killing his middle school classmate, Tristan Jensen. Remsen also agrees to provide investigators with a step-by-step -step reenactment of the murder. I was right here when he came this way. I met him right here. At the house, Remsen says Tristan wanted to buy a knife. J.P. Uh, told us that he was a knife collector. He had all kinds of knives in his house. The victim supposedly wanted to buy a, a particular knife. JP describes the knife as an Arkansas toothpick, a thin blade, 18 inches long from handle to tip. He wanted to buy it from him for 20 bucks, and an argument started over that. And it was during this argument that uh, uh, Tristan called JP, allegedly, uh, a drunken <laughs> I said, do you care to rephrase what you just said? And while I was holding him, I had the knife in my other hand. At that time, I, I uh, stabbed him with the knife. I pulled the knife out. Okay. He went limp. I stabbed him one more time. Just rammed it through his chest where it poked out the other end, pulled it out, and rammed it again through, through him just to make sure he did the killing. So he fell down into this area here? Yes. According to JP, the attack occurred on the middle floor of his family's tri-level house. He then carried Tristan to the garage. He said he believes he opened the garage door with his left hand to get in there, set him on the floor in there on the carpet. From that location, the body was eventually taken to the backyard. JP had dropped the body over the wall into the shrubbery area left the body there and there were trees that you could hide the body nobody would see it then and he waited for an opportune time he just lucked out that nobody was at home jp is able to move the body in broad daylight without being spotted we're thinking the murder occurred somewhere around 10 30 in the morning it must be maybe 11 30 now so he took a chance when he put that body into the manhole and nobody saw it it's very obvious that what he told us of the, of the path that he took for the body, that was all consistent with the evidence we found. He began telling us the truth of what really happened. His statements were consistent with the evidence at the scene, the blood splatter on the walls, where the items and evidence were located at the scene. It is right here where he got stabbed. The blood area is right in here. Investigators are amazed JP was able to both commit the crime and dispose of the body in such a short period of time. I mean, he had gotten rid of the body before mom got home from work. He had cleaned up majority of the blood. He did that all in, what, about a matter of four hours or so, approximately. We were trying to figure out if the parents had any knowledge of this crime. However, the father took a lie detector test and passed it. The mother refused. Other than that, we had no physical evidence that they were involved at all. Remsen told his parents their dogs had gotten into a fight. He told me that he'd called his mother on the phone who was working and spoke about how the dogs had gotten into a physical dog fight and one of the dogs had bled. And so he was already working a story in case his mother discovered any blood 
All the forensic evidence corroborates JP's confession. Yet there are still lingering questions that forensic experts are unable to answer. According to JP Remsen, the only items that he removed from the victim's body was the shoes. And he told me during the interrogation that if the home was searched, that we would find the shoes possibly in his bedroom, JP's bedroom. But Tristan's clothing is recovered outside the house. Cadaver dogs are often brought into a murder scene to look for evidence that could be buried or hidden. In this particular case, the cadaver dog led us to an area alongside the home where we found burnt clothing. The burnt clothing consisted of a, a pair of pants, a shirt, a cloth belt, and a belt buckle. These items were identified as belonging to our victim, Tristan. I felt there was something that he was certainly not uh, coming out with and explaining to us. Something more happened in the garage, but he didn't want to elaborate on it. Based on the blood spatter, criminologists speculate that JP dismembered the body. We located a hacksaw on a tool bench inside the garage. That hacksaw had what appeared to be blood. The hacksaw eventually went to the crime lab where they tested the blood again, determined it was blood, but discovered it was animal blood. We'll never really know what happened, but whether he was successful or not, I still believe he tried to dismember the victim. J.P. Remsen is charged with first-degree murder. Tristan's family can't quite believe he's the killer. We expected some predator or something, some child known predator or some homeless person or something. He said, well, his name is J.P. Remsen and he's a classmate, 15 years old. And it was like the world just stopped spinning. You're like, did I hear you right? What? A punk kid did this horrific thing to my nephew? A 15-year-old kid? It was, it, it was even more incredible than the crime, almost, that someone so young could do that. But Tristan's cousin, Brandon, does remember Remsen as a troubled kid. He was a... Abnormal is the only word I can think of. I mean, just a weird kid, prone to violence, loud, obnoxious. Since he was a big guy, I mean, he was a really big kid, he bullied everybody. Remsen is tried as an adult. Both the prosecution and defense agree to proceed with a bench trial, where a judge, rather than a jury, will decide the verdict. I mean, the evidence was there. He confessed. And the only thing a jury was going to determine was the degree of the murder. And I felt I had enough facts to prove first degree, so I thought I was comfortable enough trying it in front of this Superior Court judge. We chose the bench trial because, one of the reasons, because of his age. He was only 15. Being tried as an adult, he was still only 15. It could have gone where he could have had sympathy from the jurors. The trial lasts six days. I mean, and then you show up into the courtroom, and, you know, there he is, you know, stones throw away from you, sitting in a chair. And you just, thoughts go through your mind. You're like, wow, really? This is the last person to see my cousin alive? And he's just sitting there. It was like a monster sitting there, just this subhuman monster sitting there. And he was a big guy, you know, just a big monster. He never spoke up, never shed a tear, never looked remorseful, never looked like, you know, he wished he hadn't done it. We all know the facts. We've all heard what happened. You know, it's, this person is not a good person. During testimony, the prosecution describes a history of conflict between the two boys. Tristan had a lot of girlfriends. Well, these girls didn't like JP, they liked Tristan. He probably was jealous of a girl and thought, if I make this guy disappear, I have a chance now. Another incident involved JP bringing alcohol to school. We discovered that the victim had told school officials that JP had brought alcohol to school, which then in turn got JP in trouble. We believe that that was where the hatred came from, JP. 
This is my opinion. This all started over a drinking incident and the fact that both boys uh, liked the same girl. On April 26, 2000, the judge returns a verdict. He finds JP guilty of second degree murder. It's not the verdict the family was hoping for. I have the utmost respect for the judge in this case, and uh, he's a very good judge, and he decided differently. He felt uh, that the facts rose to a second degree and not a first degree murder. I respectfully disagree with that, um, and uh, to this day feel it was first degree murder. I mean, how can you how can it be second degree murder? This wasn't just an accidental killing. He didn't just slip and fall on a knife, you know? This was a brutal, attack. J.P. Remsen is sentenced to 15 years to life. He's eligible for parole after seven years in a 15 year to life. He's not going to be paroled anytime soon. Uh, we make sure that we have somebody that will attend the parole hearings. At the end of the trial, there's relief that Remsen is behind bars. There's a fear there that, that he might get out. I, I'm not afraid for me personally. I'm just afraid for everyone, uh, any child, because he just could do it again. Prosecutors believe Remsen had a violent streak that was bound to erupt. You know, they start with the vulnerable targets, animals, and then they work their way up to humans. I mean, it, it seemed to me that it was the standard, typical patterns that you observe of a serial killer. He was a serial killer, is a serial killer, who only had one victim. And unfortunately, it was my nephew, but fortunately, he was caught. I think he was becoming that sophisticated killer. In a separate trial, JP's parents plead guilty to weapons charges. His father is sentenced to two years in prison, and his mother receives three years of probation. And from Tristan's family, a special thanks to the Redlands Police. Police department was fantastic. Mike Ramos was fantastic. He was extremely kind and had a very gentle demeanor and way of dealing with really horrific subject matter. Seeing how helpful law enforcement was and the great job that they did really got me an interest in law enforcement myself. I would love to be a detective someday and do what they did, help a family. It's a terrible thing that happened, but knowing in the end that there's finally a resolution of this. A memorial held in Tristan's honor is standing room only. There was hundreds and hundreds of people there for him. People from all walks of life showed up to support him and, you know, remember him and support the family. And it just blew my mind. It was a beautiful memorial and people had many nice things to say about Tristan. He was loved.